Well, it's a pleasure speaking with y'all. Thank everybody for coming on. I know, I know some of the people here and some I don't know. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm sure when all this is over, we'll get a chance to meet in person and be uh, as friendly and, and as natural as we're going to be up in here tonight. I think I'm just going to start by saying some, just some observations about a, a way to, to handle the time that we're in now. now. The first thing is to embrace the space and, uh, and be healthy. Even if you get sick, you can still be healthy in terms of, uh, of discipline and in terms of uh, addressing your, your, how you eat and the rest that you need to get and uh, following instructions that you know you've been told really since you were a child about how to fight a flu. And uh, all of the, the, the advice you're getting from medical people, you follow that advice. Don't, 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 don't self-diagnose and don't uh, try not to panic. Um, and and the, so a lot of times when we, it's like the first time you, you swim or the first time you ask somebody to dance with you, or the first time you ride a bicycle, the first time you do many things, uh, it, it takes a long time for you to get over the fact that you're doing it the first time so you don't embrace what's going on. You're trying to make it be like it always is. Like I'm, I'm still definitely afraid of getting on an airplane, you know. And uh, I've done every kind of psychological thing I could do to try to figure out how can I not be this afraid when I'm on a plane. And um, I try to address the irrationality of it and all those things. At a certain point, I think when I really have to fly, I just have to embrace the fact that we're on an airplane, and uh, that's where I'm gonna be, and just to be in that space. So, take advantage of the space that we have. I think another thing that can help us is realize that you're with other people. You know, if you if you go somewhere, or if you can remember when you were a kid, a child, or if you're an adult now and you have children, you take them somewhere. When that child goes into an adult environment and notices that there's some other children there, they almost burst with joy. Like, I'm not going to just sit here and be bored with these adults. I can play with a child. And I think people uh, recognize other people like them. I know when I was first learning how to drive, I was so afraid on the highway. And my girlfriend at that time looked at me and said, will you calm down and look around at all the, all the people you see? And I looked around at everybody on the highway. It was in New York. And she said, do you know what all these people let you know? I said, no, what is that? She said, playing the trumpet is a lot harder than driving this car. And just that, her telling me that made me relax. So I think that uh, a lot of people are in the, in the same position we're in. A lot of us are musicians. We've lost our entire livelihood. And now we're trying to figure out, man, what, how can we hustle or what can we do? Uh, for me, I just try to access, even my father and how, how, how we grew up, he was struggling a lot, just trying to figure out how to make a living being a jazz musician. And, uh, you know, sometimes it, it, you have to use your mind to get in a space. And this space is very difficult because Everywhere we see, we don't see anything but, but devastation of our jobs, absolute loss of ability for people to congregate. We can get online and teach lessons and do the things our imagination can take us into because people still want music and they still want us and our community still want us. So uh, I think that it leads me to the next point for us is we have to start to, to define and reconnect with, with a community by interests and concerns and not by geography. And the technology allows us to do that. If you think about when you travel anywhere, if you're, if you're a musician or if you're a physician, whatever, whatever profession you happen to be in, when you see another person in your profession, if you see somebody with that trumpet case, you, you automatically get happy because you know you all have a lot in common. So I think uh, try to it gives us a chance to redefine our, our, our community, not by geography. It's interesting that even though borders have been closed because of COVID, uh, the deep thing about COVID is it's not, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's international. It's not recognizing borders. It's attacking us regardless of who or where we're from. And uh, the, the, the scientists that are, are trying and the doctors who are trying to solve this problem, they also are international. They're, they're trading secret solutions, technical data, and, it, and that, this is going on all the time. We don't see it, but it's going on. So I think we can expand our community in a strange way. When we're confined, we can also um, expand because we definitely have a common interest. One is defeating the disease, of course, but the other one is trying to figure out who we are. And the space allows us to get in a space of silence and concentration. And if you're in a real noisy house, it gets you to, to enjoy fighting who you like to fight with. I grew up with a lot of brothers. We fought all the time, but you're going to get tired of all that fighting if you shut in. So, you know, get your fighting out the way early and then you're going to relax into trying to 
trying to get to know each other. I think another good thing is to set long-term internal goals that you've always heard about, things that people have told you, things that you've thought about, and get you one good project that you want to work on in this time. And when you set your long-term goal, I think it's good to set that goal like this is not going to end for five months. Don't think it's going to end in a month because then when, when a month is over and it's not, not over, you're depressed. If you think it's going to be five months, when it's over in three months, you're happy. So it's a matter of, of that perspective. Another day-to-day -day thing is organize your short-term goals to make a, a schedule you can keep. It's kind of like if you're trying to lose weight or something and you say, I'm going to run two miles today. And you're not used to running. You might go out there and run those two miles that first day. But the next day, you're going to stay home. You're going to stay home for the next week because you don't want to endure the two miles. So get you a good, doable, daily schedule and organize your time. And uh, you know, it's gonna, it, you, you, you won't get bored. You'll be able to handle stuff. Another thing I, I think is important to pay attention to this time and everything that's going on. I want you to look at news. Don't just look at the news station you like. Look at the other stations. Read everything that comes up out of Congress, the Senate. Do things you wouldn't do. Really get engaged with the process around this because it's going to show you the, the good things and the flaws that we had. And think about it. Rethink your fundamental beliefs. Take advantage of this time. And it's only you you talking with yourself. You know, it's not a, it's not it's not even a thing that you have to share with, with anybody. But rethink it because the world, uh, we, we, can, we, we can always make the world new if just in our minds at first. It's kind of thing that I call go internal to go external. It's like when you get in the woodshed and you practice and you do something and you think about things and you realize things, then you come back out and you play. And, and people, you know, will say, man, you've been practicing. In New Orleans, we used to call it shedding. You social improvement, they say, man, you've been shedding. So go internal to go external. Another thing is, uh, you know, diversify your day in, in time-sensitive ways. It's like I, I spent most of my life on the road driving long hours because of, because of this fear of flying. So, uh, you know, a 40-hour drive, 33-hour drive, 26 hours, that's, that's, that's child's play for me in, in, in and Big Boss Murphy and, and Frank Stewart, we, we did it. And I've been on the road now for 40 years. So it's not a short time, but we did so many things because just to, to stave off the boredom. One good thing, one of the best things we ever did was the life of where people you drove with, you, maybe 10 years we've been driving together, we would start telling each other's life story to each other. After Frank Stewart told his life story, we stopped doing it. It was so colorful, we couldn't believe it. Other thing is a playlist read poems. I love William Butler Yeats, so I would read his poems and, and animate the poems. Uh, another thing that's essential is to joke and play around and clown. You, you can't use your, lose your sense of humor in this kind of stuff, you know, and, and, and notice things you've never noticed. And uh, yeah, you got you to gotta stay humorous. We would notice in the drives, you get tired near the end of a drive. So when we get, if we have a 36-hour drive, when we get in that 33rd hour, boy, I start entertaining people and making noise and hollering, screaming, and acting a fool. So, you know, when you organize your day, get a, get a, get a sense of how you want the day to flow and deal with your energy. When we get closer to a, to a destination, when they say most people fall asleep, I try to pick my energy up and clown and, 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 and get to know the people you're with. You know, when, I, when, I went, when, my, when my mother passed away, I, was, I took my daughter down to New Orleans on a train. And I was, I was just trying to tell her about who my mother was. I told her it took me till I was 40 years old to realize my mama was a person that was not my mother. And it's just to retell that history and the story of my mother's life, you think you know the people that you know, but you don't know them. So it's important to take this time to know people that you think you know, because a lot of times you only know a person by their relationship to you. And, but they're a lot more than that. Because uh, any person's relationship, they relate to many different people in different ways. And, and take advantage of this time to, to know people and get to, get to see them people in, in, in your family if you happen to be in the house with people. And uh, don't forget to have a good time with celebratory ceremonies. You got your film festival, you got your this with your friends, whatever it is that, that you like to do, get you some ceremonies. And uh, the last thing I'm, I'm going to just say is important is to stay active. Stay active in your mind, exercise, uh, argue with people you like to argue with crack jokes ever stay active act a fool clown be serious don't don't allow it because you, you'll get depressed and remember we're going to be in this for a while so you got to pace yourself and um that that's that's the, the the main of what i have to say in terms of just talking 
uh, I really want to hear from y'all and answer questions if I can and hear things. And if I can't, I mean, I can always act like I can. And if I can't do that, I don't know. I'll just turn it over to, to Adam and he'll have something to say. Linton, so that, that, to, to cue somebody in now? Yeah, th uh, thank you very much. Sorry. All right, so, no, so uh, first up, I've got Nicholas Visball. So Nicholas, I'm just going to unmute you here. Um, and you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Winton's listening. All right. Uh, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. If you could relive a live performance that you performed and like go there real quick and perform again or relive that moment, would you, which one would it be? Oh man, that's a good question. You know, you know, I don't, I don't know. I had so many, so many good ones that, uh, I played with great musicians so many times. I can't, I can't sing a lot of one, you know, it's kind of like you, like with your kids. Uh, man, uh, it's just every, every, every time I was telling the band on the last tour we went on, some of us, Ted Nash and I, we've been in the band for, for a long time, Ryan in the trumpet section, Marcus Printup and Kenny, we, Ryan and I, we've been playing 20 something years, 24 years. Every night when we finish the gig, this is over, over at least the last 15 years, I always dab him and say, yeah, man, that was that was a good one. Uh, thank you. Herlin Riley used to always say another one like the other one. So you know we have our. I, I can't I can't really pick one. I I, I love them. I I've, I've loved. Most of the gigs have been a blessing. It was great. Thank you. All right, thanks, Nicholas. All right, um, next up we've got Chadwick. Um, Chadwick, you should be um, unmuted now. <laughs> you there, Chadwick? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Winston, can you hear all right? Yeah, I can hear. Wow. Well, of course, it's the utmost pleasure to meet you. Uh, it, uh, uh, some people have talent, you know, and you obviously have an extreme talent that I very much respect love. Also, you exude, even though I have never met you, you exude a, a, an energy you know, uh, a spirit that you can feel. Uh, my grandmother used to say, you can't judge a book by the cover, but you can read the title. You can read the title. And the title of your book has is, is got a lot of great, great names to it, you know. Um, but uh, if I can tell a quick story, you mind? Yeah, tell me. All right. Um, I, I think the universe works in a certain way, and God does and everything, and, and uh, about two months ago, I started watching the jazz documentary by Kim Burns, you know, and uh, I've always been a fan of jazz, but uh, I watched that 10, the 10 uh, season or the 10 uh, episode series probably three times in a row before I stopped. And a lot of it was called the music and the history and everything. And then some of it was just to hear you, uh, your account of people and, and jazz and how it affects the world and that kind of thing. And uh, uh, you know, a, a little embarrassingly, I had a little too much to drink one night, and the next morning I woke up and I had an email that said, your order has been uh, shipped and processed, and I had ordered a trumpet, and unknowingly ordered a trumpet. And uh, at 44 years old, I started playing a trumpet, or, you know, trying to play the trumpet, and it's been perfect timing, because right now, what I do for work is I practice medicine, I have a family clinic, in Tennessee, and uh, you know, it's been a big uh, change for us in my clinic. It's a small practice, but we have now gone to practicing things way different, and you know, dealing with people in a much different way, and everything like that. So, you know, it's been a little stressful, but the the timing of what that documentary and jazz did for me, and picking up a trumpet at 44 years old, never playing in my life. It's been such a like uh, you know a, a relief and a, and a stress release that when I come home I can get away from things you know and like, even the way you accounted a lot of situations in jazz and and how it affected the world and people and problem times and that kind of thing it really kind of fits in it for me right now you know <clears throat> so it's been it's been really cool to, to kind of find a new life in that a little bit. And I guess, you know, I guess I wonder, like, for me, and watching that, realizing how much jazz 
at the most troublesome times of this country and in the world, really, how it uh, was a a foundation to give it something to, to lift up. Uh, I guess, what do you, do you, how do you see hopeful things like that, or what do you see being that found out foundation today to hopefully lift it up? I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people young, not a lot of people young, and even my age, uh, listen to a lot of great jazz. But what do you see as potential to give that that lift? You know. Well, you know, thank you for your story. I, I think, uh, you know, your optimism and your hope and all that is internal. You know, I, I had a, I had a friend I grew up with, and he was always very, uh, very, very effusive. And he was always very very um happy and optimistic and one day we were going to football practice and i had to go get him from his house and i kept knocking on the door and then he opened the door and his his house was was unbelievably filthy with a lot of kids in it and it was it was very it was it was small it was like 11 or 12 of them in the room it was, man it was it was something so when he was he came to the door he was embarrassed he said hey man don't talk about this i said i'm not gonna say nothing man but I looked at him and I thought, man, this guy, he's like the most optimistic person on the team. And he's living like his situation is rough. And I think that, uh, you know, optimism and, and, and hope and these kind of feelings, they're internal. And that's what we hear when we hear the great musicians. Like, uh, like Louis Armstrong is, is probably the best example, just a person who sounds always optimistic. But there's great music in every tradition and every culture. And every person hears something different in a different person. So... I can't ascribe a universality to it. It's what I feel, and I think a lot of people felt it. And I think the music can help us through those times if we tap into the the, the feeling that the great musicians had. And there there've been, been been many of them who who touched people in that way. And uh, I, I lean on that. I listen to the music, and I and I check it out, and I put it on. And uh, not just jazz, but there's optimism and hope in many styles of music. Our music is particularly hopeful and optimistic because it comes from the legacy of freedom after slavery. So it has that 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 kind of richness in it. And um, you know, I, I think that I, I I've seen it all over the world in many different kind of people of all generations. And uh, there's also those who who lean more toward depression. It doesn't make them less. It's just you don't want to be around them in depressing times. You want to be around the happy people. All right, thanks Chadwick for your question. Um, next up, we've got Rehan. So I'm unmuting you, Rehan, you're, you're good to go. Hello. Hey. Uh, What's um, nice uh, to see uh, you again. So um, in this kind of uncertainty situation, I would like to ask um, what, uh, what do you think about um, uh, the musicians when uh, they do the performance, uh, but without an audience? So uh, in my country, like uh, uh, some musicians did, uh, they did the big concerts like in televisions or in uh, venues, but uh, they just recorded. So without any uh, attendance or uh, without any attendance, but um, uh, people could still enjoy the music and what do you think about uh, that kind of solution? Uh, thank you. Well, I love that. I mean, we're musicians. So well, first we play for ourselves first. It, when you make recordings, you're in the studio, you, you're playing, the audience is not there. You play into the microphone, you imagine you're playing two people. And uh, if, if you think of who's heard you play the most, whoever you are, it's yourself. And when you're with a group, if you have that opportunity, y'all can congregate. Any solution to problems at this time uh, are welcome. There are no dumb ideas. The only dumb thing is to not is to is to is to abandon every idea. So anything that brings music to people that allows us to try to make a semblance of a livelihood or give people a chance to work, I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm in uh, in favor of it. I'm a fan of it. Thank you. Yes. Sir. All right. Uh, next up, Winton, we've got Alex Moore. Okay. All right, Alex, go ahead. 
Uh, hi. So we met a few years back, and the you helped me a lot with my playing, and it's been huge. And I was wondering if I could get some more advice with this. I'm trying to use this time to improve on my instrument and my really everything in general. I was wondering what you think the best way to practice improvisation is when you don't have access to jam sessions or other musicians to play with. Well, I think I I will get that get that uh one to some of those rhythm section apps and just play a concert, set out a concert and play that concert like you're playing for people. Introduce your songs. Play. I'm a big fan of just man, just act like you had a gig. Hey, most of the gigs I would see growing up, a lot of times my daddy's gigs, it would be like we was in, in somebody's house with nobody there. You know, we all have played gigs. We laugh in the band sometimes we because we grew up, some of us are kids and jazz musicians, but we see a handful of people at a gig, we, we say, well, this is a real gig now. So, you know, uh, play a gig. Get you a rhythm section app and play with it. Pretend like you're playing with people. And then uh, lay that gig out. Introduce your songs. But use your imagination. Like when you're a kid, you play with action figures and all the things you did. You went into your mind. I used to work for a man in Kenner, Louisiana. The name was Bossy Clay. He had a gas station. He used to say, boy, I've been your age, you ain't been mine. Whenever he tell you to do something or mess with you. So you gotta always remember, you can access something you, you experienced in the past. I think this is a good time if, you, if you're by yourself. Now, if, you, if you're in a, in a house or in a place where people play for them, put your, put, your, put your rhythm section on and just play a gig. Do your thing. And you're gonna get better just by, do, you improvise, you, you learn by doing it. And whenever you speak, you're improvising. So use the same logic you talk with and apply it to notes and harmonies and melodies. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Alex. Next up, we've got um, Dr. Jazz Sawyer. Uh oh, <laughs> Dr. Marsalis. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. E. Dankworth. This is Dr. Jazz Sawyer. How you doing? How you doing? Yeah, good. Man. Hey, I just got a, I got a question for you for the for the group. Can you pinpoint a time in history where musicians face similar circumstances? It's like maybe in Pops Day, because now, you know, early then there was no airports or ways to, to fly. So we're kind of, you know, uh, reset. We're in a new, a new century, just like it was 100 years ago. Man, I just, don't you know. On that, you know, like, I mean, because this is unprecedented what's going on globally, you know. Well, I don't know if there was a, a time that I can recall where people I mean, there's been plagues before, so of course, I'm sure people weren't congregating during those times. I don't know the history of those times. Like, uh, when the Spanish flu was going on, people were still playing gigs. So, um, I, I, I don't know, but I think this is an interesting time because we've lost all of our livelihoods and our ability to play, but do, because of technology, we have the chance to connect with each other around the globe in a way as never before. I'm talking to you now. Today, I, I talked to Stefano de Batista in Italy, and we hadn't talked to each other in a long time. Man, we started laughing and talking about stuff. He said, man, how long has it been since we talked? So, you know, uh, this is a good time to reconnect with people. In terms of gigs and, and, and making a living, man, I, I don't know. I can't think of a time when nobody could, could play uh, for, for a certain amount of time. But this would have to last for a year for it to be, I mean, you know, the history of Earth has been, <laughs> a lot of stuff is going on out here. And uh, a, a, a lot of stuff is going on. A lot has been beautiful, but a lot has been ugly. So I'm sure it's, it's been a lot of ugly times, uh, but I, I can't think of a time that I've read about or know about where there was no public congregation in major metropolis in such a way that people couldn't play for other people. So uh, we got, we got, we, we got a chance to do some soul searching, doctor, and figure some stuff out. Doctor Sawyer, stay on those drums. It's a good time for you to get that ride symbol together. You got it. Thank you, Doctor Marsalis. We'll talk to you, bro. Thank you, Doc. All right. Next up um, is Kirby Davis. Hi. My question is: uh, as an instrumentalist, how do you balance um, more technical work? with music as opposed to creative work? And, or, or do you separate those at all? And how does that work for you? 
you know, I don't, I don't separate that. I don't separate any technique from expression or the soul from the spirit. I, I mean, they, I don't, I don't think they can, can be removed. Really. I remember being with Paco de Luthia once we were talking and he said, he said, uh, the mind, the mind calls for innovation, but the soul cries for tradition. And I, I, I love that when he said it, you know, because it's a, we, we're human beings, we, we're animal and we're something else. So we, we, we have the, the humanity and the depth, the spiritual depth, we have the intellectual curiosity, we have the math, we have the science, we have, we have the poetry and the beauty and the lyricism, we have the irrationality, we have the rationality. Well, all of that is a part of us, 360, 360 degrees. You, you don't wanna, you don't wanna take the circle. You don't wanna deal with, with, with 180 degrees. So I don't, I don't separate them and I think they all teach each other. So I think it's, it's good to, to, to allow whatever your strong points are to tutor your weak points. And we all lean towards different things that we like to do. But I think that we, we can always be whole and we can always work towards a kind of balance and a wholeness even, even though we have strengths and weaknesses. Thanks. All right, thanks, Kirby. You're Next up is Robert Frablook. Robert, you're unmuted, you're ready to go. Hello? All right, Robert, can you hear us? Yes, I can, can you hear me? All right, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, Winton, so much for doing this. It's it's thank quite you. an honor to be able to uh, have this time uh, to get to know the people that we think we know, right? right. And uh, so using that concept, uh, I'm a band director in Winnipeg, Canada. And if we think of jazz being born out of community, and uh, to a large degree it was, right? Whatever uh, the community was. If we think about community in a face-to-face -face setting, and some of your... Um, stories uh, had to do with other musicians with your mother uh, had to uh, do with face-to-face -face, uh, type experiences if we now think of music online and creating an online community can we facilitate teach mentor uh, deal with process deal with product in the same capacity or in a similar capacity as we could in a face-to-face -face type setting? No, I don't, I don't think anything is like face-to-face. -face. But, but you know, when you have restrictions, you work inside of those restrictions and you make the best of them. So it's like if, you, if you're eating, if you, have some, if you have some protein, you eat that. If, you, if not, you try to find some beans to get the, get the protein that's in the bean. I mean, you, you work with what you have. So we, we can, nothing is like uh, being, being with people that, that, that touch, but you know, you're a band director. You, I'm sure you've been on phones talking to parents. You've had, you, your, your entire life, you've had to deal with things from a distance and you deal with them uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an emotional fashion. And some people you've had relationships with, you've never met. And, and you, you'll call them. I know many times when I was in New Orleans growing up, I would just call people on the phone, teachers or people I wanted to study with. And uh, I think we can have a closeness with, with, with people in many ways. But it's not going to be the same as you putting your, putting your, your, getting close to somebody, touching somebody. And that's why I think this whole kind of social distancing thing it will also give us a chance to appreciate the touch of a person that is not intimate in any type of sexual way. Just the basic intimacy of being with people and being around people. And this is a good time for us to, 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 to think about just, uh, just the spirituality in contact with other human beings. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Robert. Next up is uh, Keith Jennings. Keith, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Hello, Winton. Greeting from Atlanta, Georgia. Hope you are well, and uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm working on an article right now for a business community, uh, and I found myself pulling out your book, Moving to Higher Ground, where you've got a chapter on the blues. I can't think of a time the blues are more needed than now. So my question is, what, what did the blues have to teach uh, artisans, small businesses, uh, other kind of business people 
uh, dealing with these really, really difficult economic times. You know, the thing about the blues is that it puts a groove on a bad situation. So if you somebody say everything gonna be all right this morning, everything gonna be all right. Everything gonna be all right this morning. Everything gonna be all right. Like there's a certain type of definitiveness uh, to a groove. And remember, music is in this case is symbolic and representational. So it's not like you're gonna you're gonna be able to uh, you're not gonna be able to go to a grocery store and buy nothing with music, but music is gonna get inside of you and give you the type of resolve. That's why 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 movies a lot of times they they play one note and it gives you an emotion. Boom, something is gonna happen. Or and uh, I think that the blues is survival music because the people who played the blues dealt with survival, and because because their experience was about surviving. You Mississippi sharecropper, or you. Uh, a riverboat hustler in Louisiana, where, where it comes from. Something that comes out of the spirituals, which come out of slavery, which come out of the kind of Appalachian region, which comes out of a certain coal mining communities and people who are struggling. Something that comes up out of the cotton fields of Texas, that uh, comes up out of different places. It's made of that kind of, it has that kind of thing in it. And when we, when we reach for that, and when we start to evoke that, we evoke in the memory of that, and that symbolism. And that, that symbolism, um, it's very powerful. I never forget. I was I was I was sitting with with uh with BB King and Willie Nelson and Ray Charles and Eric Clapton and and and, and Willie said, "Well, gentlemen, I'm the only one here who actually did pick cotton." So it's a thing, an understanding of just this music. It comes from a long way, and when you when you listen to it and when you start to play it and you start to check it out. It gives you that type of resolve because that's survival music. People trying to survive, and a lot of the lyrics about a, a broken-hearted love or somebody did something, somebody cut somebody. Or, but underneath that is a, is the kind of uh, kind of three-tiered the, the three-tiered uh, levels of reality. And uh, you know, man, it's it's a, it's a tough time. There's no way to put a smile a smiley face on that if you got a small business or you got. Your, your business has been derailed and you're looking at uh, how you're going to survive. Uh, the only thing you actually can do is reach for community. That's all we have. Reach for community, see who we know, who we've interfaced with, the trust that we've built up with people, try to figure out where things are, ask people for help, don't be proud, look around for any type of aid and just be diligent about seeking for things and looking for help so that we can help 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 other people but I, I always think about in the airplane when they say if if the oxygen mask fall down put yours on first then you can help somebody don't kill yourself trying to help then two of y'all are gonna die so you know I, I wish i had something deeper than that to tell you but i but i really don't this is one of those times that's it's gonna take a certain type of collective wisdom that we all have together but none of us have individually thank you all right, thanks, Keith. Uh, next up, I've got Andre Adams. Andre, go ahead. Hello, thank you so much for having this talk, both of you. And uh, my main question, oh, also I'm calling him from Florida. Uh, okay. <laughs> my main question is uh, to you, what desires have you found have, have often get in the way of, of young musicians or any musicians in, in the search to attain mastery and effortless execution of music? Well, number one is the, 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 the desire to waste time. That affects all of us. Man, if you could give me something else to do that's not what I need to do, I'm happy to not do it. But the second is just uh, recognition from, 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 from uh, peers and other people. When they say something, then you, you know, you're attracted to that. I think the third is uh, the desire for some type of uh, so we have, we, have we all have insecurities, and I, I think that uh, our insecurities many times keep us from from developing, and we all have them. So we we can be highly influenced by somebody, anything that makes us feel good. It could be eating, could be drinking, could be getting high, could be 
You know, it could be a, could be a bunch of stuff. It could be a lot of times the worst drug is not even that kind of stuff. It's it's other people who assuage your insecurities and and uh, ameliorate your, your anxiety. Uh, now we're dealing with a situation where a whole community has anxiety. So you know those kind of things keep us uh, from attaining because we have to have a lot of discipline to to a lot of discipline to reach what we have inside of us, and it's just designed that way. And then when we accept that we need that discipline, then there's just some work we got to do. And then, then when we, and you don't have to work all the time. I always advise uh, my students or even myself, hey, put, put, put aside a couple hours every day to just bullshit and not do nothing. Like you can't be serious the whole time. You know, you got to get some, some part of your time you put aside to just, just, just to just to not do anything or just do do frivolous things because that way the frivolous stuff don't take it take all your time up but being productive is a lot of fun too so I, you know i think that's the main thing you know productivity you got to be wasting time is very powerful all right thank you so much thank you so much thank you for that question all right thanks andre um all right next up we've got gavin rice Gavin, you're good to go. And if uh, for you, Gavin, and for everyone moving forward, if you don't mind just saying where you're from as well, that'd be great. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm Gavin Rice. I'm from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, big fan of you, by the way. Big fan. Uh, Thank you. So now I'm really, 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 really into the trad stuff, and I know you love doing that, like in New Orleans. Um, uh, now, I guess my question is, is uh, what got you into it in the first place? Well, I'm from New Orleans, and the, my father, in the in the 1960s, told us to go play with a band called Danny Barker's Fairview Baptist Church Band. Of course, we didn't want to do that at that time. That was, you know, Marvin Gaye and the Civil Rights Movement. But we went out there and played, and uh, the, all the songs we learned, I still could could play, like Little Lives of Jane and uh, Didn't He Ramble, Just a Close Walk with the just a little while to stay. All the New Orleans songs. Being from New Orleans, I grew up with the music, so it's 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 a, it's in our heritage and our blood. We grew up with it, and um, I was against it when I was growing up, just out of ignorance, and and out of kind of a shame because I always equated it with post civil rights type of handkerchief head level of uh, uh, Uncle Tom and cheesing and, and grinning and smiling. So I didn't like the music, but then. Uh, once I realized what the music really was and the depth of the music, the beauty of it, the poetry in the music, I, I believe all the art forms that exist that we still can hear and play poetry, plays we still see and act, they're all here and they're present. Because art many times is about recreation. That's what we call recreation. Every the symbolic restatement of things is very important. And you always add your own thing to it. But Let's, let's just remember, when you play a gig or you play a trumpet, you're another person playing a trumpet. People have been playing trumpets for a long time. The elephant plays the trumpet. They blew down the walls of Jericho. The trumpet plays in so many services. The shofar is played. A ram's horn was blown. And now people played in gazebos around America in the 19th century. Buddy Bolden and then played in clubs. Mm. Then you come down right to you. You're playing in a club. You're playing somewhere. You're part of a long tradition. We're all a part of long, long, long-standing uh, traditions. Um, I heard something, that, something about what Dave Brubeck told somebody who was talking about a tradition before, and he said, "Well, you know, people climb Mount Everest, and in the, in the, in the, when they started climbing it, he said you could climb Mount Everest today. He said it is hard today; it was hard then. He said, but the one thing they both need is a rope. He said and that rope is that tradition. So, you know, yeah, I was into the into the music, and I love it even more." the more I, I listened to it, you, you know, it's, it's, it's so many great musicians that played it and I'll continue to play it in, in New Orleans. Thanks a lot, Wynn. Um, just one more thing. So now I live on Cape and you actually came down to a club down here back then and played with my bass teacher, Rob McCauley. I remember I that. Know. You do remember? Yes, man. Give my love to him. Yeah, it was like a restaurant club. Yeah, I, he was telling me about that. He was like, I, I played with Wynn Marsalis. I was like, really? I'm on the I phone with him right now. <laughs> I remember it, man. Give my love to him. That, that, but now that was like 20 years ago, maybe. Yeah. That was a while. Yeah, give my love to him. Yes, thank you so much. I'm a big fan. Thanks for letting me talk to you, man. Thank you, man.
All right, thanks, Gavin. Um, next up, we've got James Ward. James, go ahead. Hi, so I'm calling in from California, and um, I haven't I had an experience um, a couple months ago, or last month actually, uh, at the CMEA Jazz West Festival. Um, my friend was getting up to solo with the mic, and then our band director uh, told him that or told him to go back to his seat that he would move the mic for his solo because often we like to, uh, my band director likes to give everyone as many solos as he can. And um, that particular song, Swing Machine, we had, uh, I think, 10 solos. And um, so he got up to, to solo and then he went back and then he tripped on the riser. And we all, we all had to laugh about it eventually and we didn't lose any points based on it. But have you had any of those funny mishaps and uh and what do you think about them you know stuff happens we had one of our band members fell off the stage in a chair um the, the worst thing i ever had happen was uh i was playing in seattle i'm gonna tell you how long ago that was that was 1982 and i remember because it was one of my first tours and i was playing in a club jazz alley and i looked in the front row and i saw a woman laughing and I, I, I knew what she was laughing about. So I checked my zipper and it was wide open. So, you know, that kind of stuff happens. So I tell you, even to this day, the first, last thing I do before I walk out onto the stage is I X, Y, Z. So I make sure that I'm tight. And uh, you know, one time I was playing the Fosh Concerto with the St. Louis Symphony. This was maybe in 1980, I don't know, 1980, seven, six, somewhere up around there. And this one part in the fosh is really, you have to come in on a really high note, really soft. And in that gap, someone in the audience belched really loud. And then a person laughed after that. And I just messed my whole interest up. So I, I told the conductor, no, no, stop. I, I got to start again. So he didn't want to stop, but he stopped. And then the second time I said, okay, I got to really play it this time. So I kind of remember, but there's always some little things happen, you know. I like to go with that kind of stuff. I don't mind a little crazy something happens. You, 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 you fall. I have trouble with my balance now, so I'm always paying attention. And Carlos is always laughing at me, saying, "I got you, Papa," because I'm. I always tell cats when I get up on the stage, sit down. That's the most nervous I am to make sure I get up there and don't trip. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Ray. Man. All right, Winton. I've got um someone on here named Branford Marsalis. Um, no, don't don't get him. Too late. <laughs> Brantford, you have a question? <laughs> Too late, damn it. Book no. What's happening, babe? What you saying, book book? <laughs> Nothing, man. I just saw it on Facebook, so I decided to harass you. Yeah, man. Look, look, come on, tell what you what you talking about. <laughs> I, uh, about about making sure my, my, my zip dipped up before I play a gig. Hey, let's talk about that gig that we didn't learn those people's song on that talent show. Are you gonna talk about that? That was hilarious. I tried to get y'all to learn it, but y'all wouldn't learn it. Right. A long and, time ago, we was playing. We played in a funk band all through high school. Yes. No. Uh, we 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 used to learn people's songs, and we played talent shows. Now, if you didn't, you you had to, you know, you had to know people's songs because you might not make it out there alive if you didn't. So we're playing. We did Go ahead. not know the song. Go ahead, well, I knew the song. You guys did not know the song. And I had to sit at the piano and call out changes, and it was a disaster. <laughs> right. And those who wanted to kill us, and we deserved it. Right. That's right. They you remember the time we was playing because that? Because of us. <laughs> you, you remember the time we was playing that gig at Nichols, and the dudes was singing Kung Fu Fighting, and they started messing up the song. They got on the mic and accused the band of messing them up. And but then we got into that, thing. that was that wasn't at Nichols. That was at McMain. You sure about that? I'm pretty sure it was my high school. It was uh -huh. a talent show at my high school. Mm -hmm. And and uh, yeah, they came up and played kung fu fighting and messed it up. And we started laughing at them, and they lost, and they were mad. They wanted to fight after the show. Uh, we remember. had too many people in the band for that. Especially Bachi and me. Yeah, yeah. One of them are gonna mess with me. Yeah. Meet with some. <laughs> yeah, you know, man, I appreciate you calling in. Yeah, bro. You know, love, bro. Love you. Get back to it. Always. All right, book. bro. Yeah, book. See you. <laughs> yeah, my brother.
<laughs> all right. Uh, next up, we've got Anna Nelson. Uh, all right, Anna, you're good to go. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna from Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, good to see you again, Mr. Marsalis. Um, yeah, so I just had a, I had a question, uh, kind of like a financial question. So during this time, um, so you kind of talked about uh, being able to reach out to your community kind of in this time and see what their needs are. Um, uh, my question was how uh, we can supplement the income during this time that's not coming from our gigs because a lot of us as musicians we've had, uh, at least for me, I've had a lot of gigs canceled. Um, so right now I'm trying to do an, a lot of online lessons and maybe um, do like an online like monetary course. I'm wondering if you have any other ideas for how we can kind of generate some uh, music related income during this time. You know, I think that um, people who are much, who know more about online than I know would be better <laughs> because I, I, I'm not a person, I'm, I'm of that generation where I get online, but I still kind of look at this, I'm looking at this kind of an amazement, you know? So my kids are always teasing me, but I think that one thing that musicians, through the years I've noticed musicians are really good writers. And uh, there's always a need for writing. In terms of playing, I think you, know, you gotta find everything that's underneath. Like once I was, I was talking to a guy, I'm gonna just try to give you just a, an analogy of it. I was talking to somebody who said he wanted to buy a truck company. And he said he didn't have the money to buy the truck company. He said, but he noticed when he was researching the truck company that all the trucks had the same insurance. So he said, man, if I get this insurance company, I could have a monopoly on truck insurance. So he, he tried to get the, 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 the insurance. And I think that, uh, you know, once again, I got to go back to community. Who do you know? How many people have you met? Who can you call? Don't be proud. This is, this is not a time for pride. Uh, this is a time for, for asking for help, seeking help to do work, for humility, to, to, to look to everything you can possibly find. And uh, it's not bad to be humble. It's not bad to ask people for things, to rely on people, and to be told no, and to experience that, and to feel it. And uh, I always say it's very interesting, like some of the greatest people I knew was like my, my grandma, my great aunt, all people, my grandmother, People grew up on plantations, always were like maids and old school black in segregation. But the humility they would have as people and just the type of soul that would come out of them when you dealt with them, uh, the world that they lived in was larger than you would think because nobody really spoke for those people. So you, you would know what that type of, 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 of attitude, the strength in servitude, because there's the strength in that. And I think that uh, it, as humble as you can get, this is a time to be humble and get small and, and see where you can apply your services. You know, they always have a joke about playing for yourself, but this is the time we got to do that. And, uh, you know, that's just what I'm seeing. I'm seeing community. And a lot of times in our communities, we have lost sight of what a community is because the components of community are the business component, a civics component, a politics component, and a religion component. And all of those components can't become businesses. So you see a lot of the problems we have of conceiving ourselves now is, is because everything is considered to be a, a business. Religion is a business. Politics is all about business and deals and uh, things in the civic. Civics is about investment. You know, civics is I'm investing in you. I'm investing in your education. I'm investing in your healthcare. I'm investing in those things as a community because they will yield dividends to the community. And you will be a better business person. You'll be a better uh, uh, whatever it is that you are because you have a better education, because I've invested in your health, because I've been. So we have a lot of interesting things at play at time, in, in these times. It, it's going to be very curious how, how they play out when people's philosophies now are going to come up against the reality, against, against reality. So, you know, for you, you're young. You, you can play. You have a lot of en energy. You're industrious. I say, get out there and hustle and take advantage of this opportunity to become really humble. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for thank you for calling. All right, thank you, Anna. Uh, next up is Jonathan Neal. 
Go ahead, Jonathan. All right, what's going on, uh, Doc? Um, Look at it. Talk about it. Uh, I'm here in Nashville. Um, I just got done having a conversation with somebody about uh, just the seriousness of musicians. Um, and um, I, I'm doing, I'm writing my thesis right now on Prof Fielder. And, <laughs> you know, so I, I just wanted to ask you what, um, I guess, or you could just, just you could just talk about um, like what Prof Fielder did for you while he was, uh, while you were under his wing. I was so country at that time. You know, my brother called this and remind me back, just back then, we didn't, we didn't know nothing. A guy brought me an album of Maurice Andre playing some trumpet concertos. So I'd never heard of it or Maurice Andre. He told me, man, he's in college. He, I, was, I was like 12 or 13. He said, go check this out. So I checked it out. And then me and my brother would learn songs off the record, like Earth, Wind, and Fire tunes and stuff. And we would write all the notes down, not as music, but as their name, like F, G, B, B, D, D. So I started trying to learn. I was listening to these concertos. And this one had a piccolo trumpet. And I was trying to play the piccolo trumpet like a real, like, a, like with, a, with a B flat trumpet. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea, how does this man get this sound on the trumpet? And uh, Prop Fielder came by my house. And boy, he was just a country. I got to get Sean Jones to imitate Prop. He got the best imitation. Well, Prop, you know how Prop be talking like, well, you know, you got to always be satisfied. Yeah. You got to always be gratified, never satisfied. <laughs> so Prop came over to my house and I asked him, I said, hey, Prop, he was teaching in Mississippi Valley State. This might've been 1973, 74. I said, hey, Prop, how does this dude get the sound on the on the on this trumpet? And he listened to it, he started laughing. He said, Man, that's a piccolo trumpet. I said, a piccolo trumpet. Man, they got piccolo. He said, Yeah. He said, Man, go in my car and get this this trumpet I got. And if it and it was an F trumpet. He said, I'm gonna let you have that trumpet for fifty dollars. So okay. We was playing funk gigs. I said, okay, man. I I, I got he gave me that trumpet. And then I started trying to practice on it. F trumpet was hard to play. Then he came back uh, maybe uh, two months later. He said, man, I'm a, I got you a piccolo trumpet. And if you learn how to play the Brandenburg Concerto number two, third movement on this piccolo trumpet, mm. I'm going to let you have it. Man, he brought that trumpet out there as a queen on, silver piccolo trumpet. Well, I looked at that piccolo trumpet. I started trying to play it. I couldn't get a sound out of it. It was terrible. He said, well, when I get back here, if you can play that, I'm going to let you have it. So I told my daddy. And my mom, I said, make sure this man don't come back here till <laughs> I can play this concerto. And then uh, eventually he came back. I, I mean, I couldn't play it good, but I played it good enough for him to let me have it. Yeah. He taught me about all kinds of stuff, man, like breathing. The main thing Prof did for me then being in New Orleans was give me a sense of the world. He was talking about the Chicago Symphony and Chickowitz and all this stuff seemed so far away. And Adolf Herseth, he talking about Maurice Andre, and then he'd tell me about when he knew Freddie Hubbard and Lee Morgan and them in the early 1960s and, and what Book of Little was like. And so Prof opened my mind up to the world. And, the, and you know, Prof was always just his country, man. Yeah. He just, just the way Prof talked, he always would make me laugh. And uh, I got to get Sean on the next time to get him to imitate, imitate yeah. Prof Fielder's voice. Yeah, I love Prof. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, man, thank you. Thank you for reminding me of Prof. Oh, Prof yeah. thing was about breathing. Now, you know, Prof would always say, you can have air, you can have uh, air pressure without air flow, but you cannot have air flow without air pressure. So you got to try to have flow when you're playing. I don't want pressure. I want air flow because that makes it be like the wind is just passing through the earth. I don't want pressure. I want flow. That's it right there. Yeah, that was proud. Yeah. Cool. Appreciate it. I've talked to you. Man, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And next up, we've got Robbie Cruz. Go ahead, Robbie. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us and having us here. Uh, thank really, you. really appreciate it. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, just wanted to ask, calling in from Philadelphia. Um, what are some ways that I can kind of stay fresh and uh, 
enhance my recovery uh, day to day on this basis because I'm practicing a lot with free time. I want to know how I can maximize effectiveness and what are some ways to work on extreme tempos such as fast up tempos or like fast rhythm changes or slow blues? Man, that's that you know, that's that's the people calling me right now to give me that the good advice. I think it's uh if you work on wanna work on flat fast tempos, play fast. You know, I, one thing Dizzy told me about playing fast, he said when he had to play really fast tempos, he would tap his feet on one and three. A lot of times people uh tapping and they leaning on two and four, he would say play on one and three. Another thing I think about just when you're trying to develop something in general, uh, I, I believe in schedules, you know. You get your, set your schedule out. Try to do things you can't do. And work on those things slowly. And I think also chart your progress. An another good thing is to tape yourself. Tape yourself playing and be as critical listening to yourself as you are when you listen to other people. And another thing that's good about taping yourself is when you tape yourself, you can hear you can hear it and be, don't be so critical you don't want to play, but get right in that mid, mid ground and you see things you want to do and then work on them. And I tend to believe in working on your ears. I like a lot of play along with changes and just sing. Because when you hear something, you can play it. And, and we musicians, we're really dealing with our ears, our imagination and our ears. And uh, I'm, I, I'm, I, would, I would say another thing is, is a, uh, Specific things like working on playing fast and working on harmonies, there's a certain level of repetition that comes with that. And also going to the root of whatever your problem is. There's different reasons that different of us don't play fast. Without me seeing you play or hearing you, I can't tell you what makes you struggle to play fast. But we all have different problems. Like I always rushed. I would always ask my brother, man, am I rushing? And he would always name some, some head of Russia at that time. He would say, yeah, Brezhnev. You know, yeah, you rushing, man. And I was always cognizant of playing. Let me, let me, let me, let me uh, try not to rush. Then of uh, trying to hear the harmonies and playing in the, in really what the rhythm section is playing. Each of these things, you just got to address one at a time and unpack them and get to the fundamental root of, of why you struggle with those things and look at it and address it and they will get better. You got time now. Yeah. yeah, you got some time now. Deal right. with and, and the other question was like for a trumpet specific question, like how do we recover on a day to day basis? What, how can we maximize like, um, you know? Well, I didn't, for me specifically, I get stiff. I, I get I find response I lose responsiveness and get stiff. So I didn't under, I didn't understand you meant for trumpet. Warm down. That's what Prof Fielder was always talking about. Warming down. So you warm up and then you warm down. Go down into the pedal pedal register. When you finish playing, warm your chops down. So. You know, you spend, I don't know, 30 minutes warming up, spend another 15, 20 minutes, warm down. Play some pedal tones, soft, long tones in a low register, and, and warm your energy down. Now, that takes more discipline than warming up, but good luck. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, thanks, Robbie. Um, okay, so just a heads up for you guys, we've got a little over 10 minutes left, so we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, if we don't get to you tonight, we'll be doing many more of these. So just keep an eye out for on our socials for um, when we're doing the next one. Um, but in the meantime, we've got time for at least a few more. So we'll, we'll carry on here. Um, next up, we've got Larry Jenkins. Uh, go ahead, Larry. Hey, how you doing again? Um, I'm calling from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, see, actually, my boy Jonathan Neal was just up there a second ago. But um, what I wanted to ask is, uh, with all the success that you've had over the years and all the accolades, everything that you've accomplished, um, well, what goals do you have moving forward? Like, what's next for you in your mind? Can you hear me? I try to just, I try to just get, uh, get, become a better musician. My goal now in this time, I have a, 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 a student of mine, but really I have so much respect for him. 
And we we said we I told him in the beginning of the year I was gonna play all 14 of those Auburn characteristic studies. So I'm trying to work on that in this time to show him that I can do it. And he's supposed to do the same thing uh for me. He's working on this recital now. Um, but I try to just get deeper into the things that I work on, read, study, learn, try to reflect on all the stuff that I've learned to be a better leader, uh, to, to get deeper with my organization, to try to affect change in the world, using the spirit of jazz for good, and to try to, uh, to, try, to try to just be a deeper, more, more of a part, more integrated in things, and to become humbler as I, as I grow older so that I can become better. And, uh, mm. you know, I try to, I try to, try to study, man, and, 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 and read and be for real. And just, I always say that for, for me in, in my, in my life, I just had that type of relationship with my, with my father. And, and for, for each of us, we have different people. We have those types of relationships with some people that's their mama, some people that's a brother. Then my brother was on here. I, I had that with him, him too, when I was younger, because, you know, he taught me how to speak English and everything about learning it was always me and him together we was in the same little room together with a lot of experiences together but i saw my father struggle so much on gigs and with the music and for me it left an indelible imprint on me so even at this age i think you know i want my father to be proud of what i'm doing like i want him to listen to these pieces mm. i wrote i want him to and now you know, you know he's up in age he's, he's like at that stage and i was thinking man you know i always wanted him to to feel like he didn't waste his time, all the sacrifice he did for us. And I grew up, man, you know, when we was, a lot of times guys, we play ball with and stuff, they didn't, they didn't have daddies, man. I remember a guy, a friend of mine looked at me and said, man, can I come to your house so I can see what it's, it's like to have a daddy? And things that happen to you when you're 11 or 10, it's interesting how you could be as old as I am, man, 58, and they come back to you and you start to reflect on them. So, you know, I try to be humbler and learn and study more and be more honest about about what I feel about 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 things that are going on in terms of uh, of, of 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 the music and our culture and our society and our our uh, and I feel like a blessing that I was given to be able to come out here and play and represent so many musicians I had a chance so many great mentors man of all kinds and I could just start naming you know the, uh, from John Lewis to Elvin Jones to Jerry Mulligan to I, the list goes on and on, man. The time that they spent with me and the way they would talk to me and the stuff that they taught me to Betty Carter, to this, to that, to Sarah Vaughn and, 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 and Dizzy. And, they, you know, I, and, and even even mm. some like a musician like John Faddis, the time he took on me and the, the way. So I, I, the list is it, it's endless. Then all the great musicians I've had the chance to play with and have the chance to play with every night that I could. I could sit in my, in my trumpet section with these unbelievable musicians, with Ryan and Marcus, with, with, with Kenny and the, the type of bond that we've had through these years. Or with, 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 I mean, just talk to Vincent Gardner, with Elliot Mason, or any of them. And, and then now I talk yeah. to my brother, all the gigs we play. So I'm giving you a long answer, but it's just to try to let the weight of all that seriousness come on you. And then, you know, all the people that have come to gigs and the people I've had a chance to meet through all these years and kids, stuff I signed. And, 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 and listening to them play. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people at this point. That's 40 years of it. And I, I just try to, try to, you know, thank the Lord. Cause you don't, you don't get everything. You know, you get what you get. And you got to, you got to look at what you get and be very grateful. Not at what you didn't get. So mm. that, that's where I'm trying to come from in this, in this period. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. That's, thank you. Thank you, Larry. All right. Um, next up, we've got Lisa Smith. Lisa. Right now. Hi. Um, I'm a French horn player, and I also teach middle school band. And I'm actually calling with more of an educational question. Um, I, as a performer, and then subsequently a teacher, like to try to motivate my students to connect with the music and connect with each other while playing and then also connect with the audience. And you have many videos out there that I've used and quoted from in the past. And I actually am wondering if you might be willing to um, put together some short releases of those videos. Um, one in particular that I have used frequently is when you spoke about um, being a, maybe in high school or a young musician yourself, and thought yourself maybe a hot shot 
and um, you were asked to play in an orchestra. And I believe even it was a youth orchestra and your part being a trumpet part in an orchestra um, was maybe a little boring. And the first rehearsal you spent time um, thinking it was boring. And then subsequently you kind of humbled yourself and came back and realized that your part within the music was much more valuable than just your fancy notes. And I've used that um, video time and time again with students um, and ask them to play something again and think about somebody else's part and how their part fit in. And as someone who's needing to educate a performing class online um, for the next, the rest of the school year probably, um, my goal is for the students to continue to be creative, want to create, and I'm hoping that we can use this time to motivate them to lose their self-consciousness and put things out there um, for critique and for help. Um, and I think your videos are great for that. Your, some of the things you say are great. And I'm wondering if you might be willing to help the educators and put together some of those older videos um, as opposed to having to go search for them all over. Okay. Well, at first, I appreciate you saying that they have been of any help and uh, much respect to you and what you do. The good middle school band, I, I would drive a long way to hear one. And uh, good luck teaching your kids in this time. I know you, you know, make it fun for them and keep that energy. I'm going I'm to try to look into that and see if I can get old Adam. Let's see about it, Adam. You got it. You, you and Aaron, let's get it going. Okay. So we'll see what we can do. And thank you for calling in. And, and, and God bless you. You're doing God's you. work with them youngsters. So God bless you. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Um, so we got time for just one more. Um, lastly, I've got Dakota Swanberg. Dakota, go ahead. There you go. How you doing, Winton? All right. So over the summer, oh, I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada. My bad. Over the summer, I read the Herbie Hancock Possibilities book. And he talked about ups and downs, his success and his failures in life. And later on in the book, he talked about playing some gigs with you. Uh -huh. it was he talked about when you're a younger trumpet player, upcoming trumpet player at that time. And after one of the gigs, uh, he went to go check up on you in your hotel room and you're looking out the window. Was there something that changed your perspective in life or in music from that night forward? From that gig? I don't know, but I'm, I'm gonna tell you a funny story about me and him. We we're playing gigs and I was complaining about the money I was making. <laughs> and he took me, he, he took we before the gig, he took me to the curtains and he said, he said, look out there. Then I was 19. I said, Jay. He said, You see all those people out there? I said, Jay. He said, if you don't walk out on the stage, all of those people are still gonna be there. If I don't walk out there, they're gonna leave. That's why you're getting paid what you're getting paid. Then I looked at him and I said, oh, he made it very plain for me. He said, let's go, man. And then we walked out on the stage and played the first song. So I always think about uh, Herbie <clears throat> and just how nice he was to me when I was 19 and 20 playing with him, man, I'd be lost on every song. <laughs> and uh, he took care of me. You know, he was, uh, he, he, he looked out for me. He, he, he made me be confident. And he's one of the nicest people in the world in terms of just uh, never have anything negative to say about, about people. And very, uh, he's just very accepting of people. And one of the stories, I remember uh, a, a great South African musician named Mbeki, uh, Becky Msaleku. Becky has passed on now, but then Becky and I were both maybe teenagers. Or Becky might've been three, two or three years younger than me. And we were at Tivoli, we were pl playing, we were in, uh, in Copenhagen. And Becky came up with uh, some music he had worked on after a sound check. And because we were near age, he said, hey man, can you get Herbie to help me with my song? So I didn't, you know, I didn't wanna, so I, I looked, I said, I said, okay, man, I'm gonna ask Herbie. So Herbie took Becky's song after, after our sound check, we had a gig that night. And he worked on Becky's song for a good 35 or 40 minutes with all the changes. And at the end of it, he said, man, 
this is an unbelievable song. You're a great musician, man. You went through a whole thing with Becky. And Becky ended up being a very influential musician in South Africa. A lady moved to London. And Becky wrote some unbelievable songs. And I never forget the name of the song was Things We Used to Do on Intuli Street. And uh, it showed me something about Herbie just to see the type of humanity he had that he spent that much time on Becky's song. And uh, it, it left an imprint on me. So I don't know about the night I was looking out the window. I looked out windows many nights. I might have been <laughs> wondering, what am I doing here? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Dakota. All right, Winton. So that's that's about it for for this first session. Um, we did quickly. We did get a, a Facebook comment from a woman. That we, it might be nice to to shout out. She. Um, she wrote on, on Facebook and said, Hi, Winton, isolated in a retirement home in New Orleans, hard to practice. We'll make it through 59 years plus of playing doesn't just go away. So uh, wondering if you want to sign off by giving Sally Jackson in the, her New Orleans retirement home a quick shout out. Okay. I want to I want to shout out Miss Sally Jackson and retirement home in the Crescent City. Do your thing. I'm with you. It's never too late. Get on your horn. Make them feel you. And if you're not, sing loud. Um, I, I want to thank all of y'all for coming on. We're gonna be back on. We got a, a lot of little different things we're gonna do and we're gonna talk about. This is just like introductory, and uh. You got ideas and thoughts for us, send them to us. We ready, jazz.org. We got Aaron Bisman, he's on 24 hour call. Don't worry about it. And Adam is here. We all up in here. Let's see about it. We're gonna do our thing. I hope you all enjoyed it. It was certainly uh, enjoyable for me connecting with everybody till we meet again.